Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this evening's Woods into Management webinar. Um, this evening's webinar is on the subject of using your own timber, firewood and wood fuel production and use. And uh, the speaker this evening is Neil Harrison of Reheat, who I'll be handing over into a minute. Uh, just a few words about um, the background to the project and um, uh, a few things about this evening's webinar. Um, Neil, if you could just move on to the next slide, please. Um, so this webinar is part of the Woodland Management Focus Area Pilot Project, which is funded by the Forestry Commission through the Woods Intermanagement Forestry Innovation Fund. And what we're doing through this project is using geographic information systems to identify clusters or focus areas of unmanaged woodland. We're then also running this programme of woodland webinars on a variety of subjects, uh, providing landowner support and advice in the focus areas, and also running um, an evaluation of the woodland status against the United Kingdom forestry standard and we will soon have the clusters identified through the GIS and um, we'll be contacting woodland owners in those areas. Um, so um, what we'll be doing this evening is um, speaking about these subjects, talking about markets, the, you know, the different types of markets, the, the requirements of individual markets, uh, a little bit about legislation and quality schemes, which of course is of increasing importance, and, and then questions and answers at the end. Um, if you do have any questions, please put them into the chat as we go along, rather than sort of verbally asking questions. You can um, get to the chat by just moving your cursor to the bottom of the screen, or if you're on a tablet, just tapping the screen should appear either at the top or, or bottom of the screen. Um, and then if you tap on that, and then just enter your question into the box. And when it comes to the end, we will ask you to unmute yourself and ask your question. Or if you would rather we can ask it for you, please just put that at the end for your question and we'll do that. Um, so, and as I just mentioned, we are recording this evening's webinar. We'll make it available on the Heat YouTube channel for people to watch later on. So uh, without any further ado, as they say, I will pass over to Neil Harrison to talk about this evening's subject. Neil. Um, I'm going to have to speak about um, sort of the, you know, the, the fiery end that timber can often come to um, from uh, unmanaged and um, previously uh, London managed woodland. Obviously, sort of quality tend to be fairly poor, so it tends to be steered towards these lower value markets for, for biomass. So what we're going to cover today is uh, um, sort of starting out looking at the markets um, and then looking at what it takes to meet those markets and then some of the legislation that uh, impacts a little bit about reheat with the um with the sort of host and managing body for uh, this particular uh, project um who are we what are we will our roots kind of go back to um working the forestry sector um the best part well, more than 20 years now um we specialize in, in biomass um, and forestry but also work in things like heat recovery and district heating and other forms of low carbon energy um, we're a bit of a hybrid of staff who work in purely consultancy um, and uh, engineering teams who are out and about installing, maintaining, servicing biomass equipment um, and, and sort of project managing installations and bits of consultancy work for the kind of clients that you see there, as well as a lot of um, sort of traditional farms, uh, estates uh, and uh, private bodies. Um, our office is uh, in Annick in Northumbria, which I'm speaking to you from now. And we also have staff uh, based out in the field in Cumbria and uh, up on Speyside and uh, also in Glasgow. And we work across the UK uh, and Ireland and sort of further afield as well. Um, some bits of Eastern Europe, Africa, we've done work in New Zealand, places like that, and then um, it's in the States. So yeah, we uh, aren't quite far flung. Um, so first of all, I just want to talk about the, the markets that are the focus of today um, and what sort of drives those markets is um, a lot of it in the in the press at the moment. Um, heat as a nation remains our single biggest challenge to tackle in terms of reducing our carbon emissions. It's been fairly poorly addressed over the last, um, well, the last sort of 15, 20 years, really. Nobody's really got to grips with it. There's been various things like the renewable heat incentive, clear skies, a low carbon building program, but we're still in a situation where even though 37% of our UK emissions are attributable to heat, only around 7% of them today are actually from renewables. So there's a huge amount of space heating, hot water production, cooling and industrial processes, um, which need to be tackled with renewable sources of heat. Um, and 
certainly the leader at the moment uh, among the ones that are deployed in that 7% is, is biomass. Also in the news a lot at the moment is this whole issue around gas prices and energy bills, which are feeding um, through into people's own energy bills. Uh, come April, I think we're all going to get a pretty nasty shock on our electricity bills. We start to feed through into people whose contracts have come to an end um, and defaulting to some very, very high rates. You know, speaking to some commercial organisations that we work with, um, their um, electricity bills are, and this is for commercial companies, big ones, you know, north of 20 pence a kilowatt hour, in some cases north of 30 pence a kilowatt hour for electricity, which is you know, a very big shock for businesses to take. So that's actually renewing interest in, in lower cost forms of renewable heat and uh, also potentially renewable power, uh, and that's um, biomass and wood fuel amongst those. I know I try to keep my two wood burners going as much as I can when I'm at home at the weekend, uh, just to stop using gas so much. Um, so what have we got um, sort of to, to, to deal with this material? So in terms of um, what we can do with it in, in domestic and, and other settings, um, we have a range of different system types and there's a continuum of sophistication and automation that, that we can use to burn wood to release heat. So the very basic end of this, the scale, a metal box with the window in the front and, and in go your logs and you know, you're feeding that a few times an hour just to, to heat rooms um, in a domestic property, you know, a small office and all sorts of different settings. Up the scale a little bit, log boilers. So automated batch fed log boilers, we'll talk a little bit about those. Um, pellet boilers uh, and wood chip boilers. And um, we'll not talk about pellet boilers, we'll talk a little bit about these three types, but what we'll focus on for the rest, most of this evening is talking about logs uh, and how to produce them, how to get it right so that they are uh, you know, fit, fit for purpose. Um, there's a lot of sort of decisions go into the choices that people make around the type of appliance they want to use. Um, lots of things around how much of the existing heating system and fuel that they want to display. So for, for me during lockdown, adding a second wood burning stove was a, um, you know, a good move for us in a, in a sort of four bedroom house in a, in, a, in a village that's well served by a gas grid. Couldn't find room for a biomass boiler of any description. So I wanted to put in as much wood burning capacity as I could. So a couple of chunky wood burners downstairs and we very, very rarely use the wood burn except on the cold and the gas boiler rather on the coldest day. So how much do you want to get rid of as much as possible? Where, where are you? What's your counterfactual fuel cost? That's slightly changed now since gas prices have gone through the roof. Um, gas and oil are not really that big a difference in terms of price now, uh, whereas it used to be that um, off gas grid fuels were uh, more expensive. That's not the case. Um, have you got good supply locally? Um, I'm guessing if you're on this seminar, you have got a good supply available to you. So that's a, sort of a decision that's made if you're looking to use it yourself or looking to enter the market as a supplier. Um, the availability of reputable installers, um, obviously for wood burning stoves, the majority of wood burning stoves are generally well installed. I have seen a few horrors, but generally that supply chain is well sorted out. Companies who are skilled, experienced, qualified and appropriately kite marks, not the same for um, sort of more sophisticated biomass boilers. So log boilers or chip boilers, that has been a bit of the wild west um, over the last decade or so. Um, how much automation do you want? Do you want to actually have any involvement with it or do you just want to kind of flick a switch and just leave it to its own devices till the fuel store is empty? That's a definite consideration. And then the availability of subsidy support, nothing much at the moment, but there have been some pretty um, generous schemes on the go for the last 10 years or so. And then what you can afford as a budget. Um, and within each of these project product types, so starting with domestic log burners, there's obviously a huge range of um, individual products with a big range of uh, efficiencies and prices. So you could get something like this, which um, you can buy from Machine Mart. You could get something like this, which you'll get from your top end high street designer stove store. Or you could do something yourself, buy this on eBay or um, completely illegal. But uh, you could buy something like this uh, or make it yourself and just convert it from a, from a uh, gas cylinder. Prices to match. That's 238 quid, that's 10 times the price, that's 50 quid, or you could make it yourself from a, a discarded cylinder for a couple of angle grinder discs and some, and some paint and a bit of welding. So, you know, um, a huge range of different appliances out there. Just in terms of characteristics, understanding these things, you know, there's a, there's a big, big number of these out there and the sort of numbers growing all the time. I know there's lots and lots of wood burner installers I speak to um, from time to time. Um, are very busy at the moment. Gas prices are definitely helping drive this market at the moment. Um, they need fuel below 20% moisture content. We'll come on to that as part of um, the, the later slides. 
It can burn clean, dry waste wood, um, as long as it is clean. Um, so things like pallets, cable drums, packaging, um, works well as kindling or pallet blocks, as long as they're not made of um, like composite materials or chip. Um, they can be quite a good uh, source of fuel for this. Obviously, if you're getting from woodland management, it's going to be um, purely virgin material. We covered the cost, lots of suppliers. Biggest you'll typically get one of these things at is 40 kilowatts, but that's a, that's a big old stove. Um, typically, you're more typically looking at three and a half and five kilowatt units to, to heat a room or a couple of rooms. Um, the most efficient of these, um, I'm aware of, is the Burley Fireballs, which I put in my front room um, during lockdown, and that's um, around the 80% efficiency mark, and that's the available heat in the fuel being converted to useful heat in the room. That's the measure of efficiency in a wood burner. You can also get options to provide hot water uh, with a backboard on one of these things. And um, yeah, it can be, um, you know, my in-laws who are both approaching 80, use a log burner pretty much all the time, or three log burners to, to heat their cottage in Northumberland. And um, yeah, still going strong in their 80s and, and using wood to heat their property. So um, all sorts of different things. And about one and a half million at the moment uh, installed in the UK. So, you know, a big, well-established market um, right across uh, rural Britain and into, into towns and cities as well. But obviously, High identities uh, in sort of you know villages and um, rural market towns. Um, log boiler, slightly more sophisticated piece of equipment. What you can see here um, is an Etta, uh, it's a leading Austrian brand uh, log boiler with a couple of accumulated tanks next to it. They're manually fed. You would typically feed them once, perhaps twice a day on the coldest uh, days. Uh, they charge up those tanks like a, like a battery, and then those batteries discharge into the heating system to provide hot water for, for the property. Um, it could be a really good off-gas grid solution if you have access to your own timber and you want to heat your house with it and, um, uh, and be cost-effective. They, like wood-burning stoves, require fuel at around 20% moisture content or below to be truly efficient and effective. Again, they can burn clean waste wood. You really should always have one of these with an accumulator tank. So that accumulator tank is, you know, as it cools, you then reload the log boiler and it recharges the heat into those like a battery. If you ever have a log boiler or a batch burner without uh, accumulator tanks, you will end up with something which becomes very heavily tarred and can be a real problem. And in fact, it can actually become um, quite a serious kind of fire risk um, where you don't have that accumulator tank to present an artificial load to the system. Relatively low cost compared to a pellet or a chip boiler. Um, and there are lots of suppliers in the marketplaces like anything, you know, you're sitting in a queue of traffic, there'll be all sorts of cars in there, some of which would be quite happy to do 25,000 miles a year and last for five years, some of which would be happy to do 5,000 miles a year and last for five years. Um, the log boiler is the same, um, some cheaper equipment from um, typically, typically from Eastern Europe. Um, Scandinavia kind of next best and then definitely the Austrian equipment at the top of the pile um, it's a very very well developed marketplace lots of competition lots of partnerships between universities and manufacturers that have refined these into some pretty special products um, usually available up to about 200 kilowatts but if you've got a 200 kilowatt log or batch fed burner you're pretty much full time um, feeding one of those things to, to meet your heating needs you can get automatic ignition, it's unusual, but you can get it. And certainly in the sort of premium end of the market, you, you'll find things like um, or internet enabled touchscreens become available. So not only will the boiler um, kind of stop heating your radiators uh, when it starts to run out of fuel, it'll also send you a text message or an email to say, you know, come on, come and feed me. It's like having a kind of um, an internet enabled dog at home that tells you it's hungry. Um, the way these things operate, they are called uh, the more efficient and modern ones are downdraft gasifiers. You see there the chamber, the upper chamber is loaded with split firewood, usually um, half meter lengths, although some bigger ones uh, will take meter lengths of, of timber. Um, nice and dry, you ignite the bottom and it burns down. So the air is being pulled down into that combustion chamber you can see in the bottom by the, the ID fan, uh, induced draft fan, and it burns very, very cleanly, very efficiently. If you look through the little window in those boilers at the bottom, basically looks like a jet engine, it's that clean burning. Um, bit of a cutaway there, just so you can see what's going on. You can see here sort of loading, cleaning, ignition doors, um, ultimately a tube cleaning, sort of rattle the handle and these spirals go up and down, and clean the tubes, keep it nice and efficient. Uh, refractory lining on the inside, removable panel, so you can get in and clean it, uh, and then, computer controlled air, com uh, air feed and all the rest of it to optimize combustion and make these things as efficient as possible. One of these boilers, you can, and certainly in the premium brands, you can see these in terms of combustion efficiency, which is 
uh, sort of realizable heat from fuel in excess of 90%, so, which is as efficient as a gas boiler. Um, so very, very sophisticated and um, yeah, uh, efficient systems. And that's just a picture of that little combustion chamber at the bottom. So refractory line. So, you know, eventually after a number of years, this stuff will wear out. It's very sort of simple standard components you can replace. So looked after properly, one of those sorts of boilers will last you 15, 20, maybe even longer uh, years uh, to heat a property. So it can be a really, really good investment if you've got, you know, bigger, older, colder, drafter rural properties. Best fit customers, uh, you can see them there. So yes, you are the fuel feed mechanism, so you do need labor available. Um, they are more sensitive to fuel moisture content uh, than, than chip boilers, for example. Pretty big footprint required. And also you could find yourself, you know, a four bedroom house heated to the max with one of these things and doing all the hot water. You might need 10 tons of logs a year. So, you know, you need to be ready for that and your customers need to be ready for that. Chip boilers are the end of the scale. So chips are the, um, sort of the lowest cost form of automatable fuel. Uh, again, chip boiler from ETA there, you can generally find a chip burn, chip boilers that will run from 10 to 60%. At a small scale, you're usually below 35% moisture content. Um, and sizes, you know, we do, we've do we done everything from 20 kilowatt boilers to we're on site next week commissioning a three megawatt boiler for a, a distillery for Diageo up in the north of Scotland. So that's at three meg, but you can get 20 megawatt and beyond um, in terms of wood chip boilers. High capital cost, probably roughly double the cost of an equivalent log boiler because of all the moving parts. Connected into here is a fuel store agitator, there's augers, there's all sorts of moving grates, deashing systems, all sorts of things. So there's a lot more going on in a wood chip boiler than, in it, than in it, there is in a log boiler. Um, but you are replacing your own kind of muscle power with that technology. Um, and you can also typically burn wood pellets in them with some, some modest adjustments to the feed system. So they're the sort of technologies that are available. Again, just a cutaway there to show you what's going on, the combustion chamber, multi-pass heat exchangers, um, induction, induced draft fans, uh, you know, automatic tube cleaning, you know, with the more sophisticated systems, these will not typically need to be seen more than once every six months um, by a service uh, contractor. So they can run in all sorts of applications. We put them into hospitals and care homes, hotels, district heating schemes, all sorts of places. So um, yeah, really, you know, very, very highly refined and well-developed systems. Best fit, so big and very big houses, clusters of houses on district heating schemes. We look after a number of district heating schemes for clients. I think the biggest we have at the moment is 91 properties of social housing provider in Shropshire that we look after. And pretty much any big heat load can be served with a, with a with chip boiler. Sort of things to look out for if you're ever involved in these is the design of a fuel store. Seen some absolute disasters over the years. The project costs, people think how much the cost of a biomass boiler. I was asked this recently by somebody doing some consultancy work for government. And he thought that once I'd given them the cost of the biomass boiler, that was it. Actually, the biomass boiler is about a third of the overall project cost. Um, the rest of it is construction and installation, pipe work, and all that sort of fun stuff. Fuel quality can be pretty ropey, and also that installer competence. There's not really anything sort of governing who can get into the market or how to get into the market. So that's the kind of products we can see in the market. We might be serving with um, the products from our, our, our woodlands. We are going to focus on logs for the, for the rest of the evening, but I have to answer questions on specific aspects of um, chip production. Um, if you're not already producing chip, that is quite a complicated and expensive game to get into. Um, but happy to take any questions on that as we progress. So just to start, I mean, the key thing is really to start with is, is moisture content. So we express that as a percentage on a wet basis, and we abbreviate that to MC or M slash C. As a rule of thumb, most wood which is fresh felled, it does vary between species and time of year, but broadly speaking, you're around 50% moisture content. Um, Sawmill residues um, from a green mill, therefore, if they're taking in green timber and, and cutting it to make fencing and things, will be around 50% moisture content. It's then a case of how do you get that moisture out of that wood and get it down to a level at which you want to, um, or, or you're able to put it into the market to, to meet the customer's needs. Um, so that moisture content is, is the calorific value, expressed as CV of the wood, and we measure that in kilowatt hours or megawatt hours in terms of what's, what's available from that in a, in a given volume or tonnage of wood. And the higher the moisture, con moisture content, the lower the calorific value of the resulting fuel. A few conversion factors there, if you work in old money, um, 
thousand megawatt hour, uh, so one gigajoule if you're working that is equivalent to 278 kilowatt hours. And if you're still in BTUs, one kilowatt hour is 3,412 BTUs, but very, very few um, people or systems will, will work in BTUs now. Um, it's all about the calories, just to sort of show you the difference that um, getting rid of as much of that 50% of the, uh, the water in the wood as possible makes in terms of realizable energy. If you can get rid of all of it or nearly all of it, you can get in the equivalent amount of wood you can get up to in a ton, you can get up to close to 5,000 kilowatt hours of, of, um, of re realizable energy from that same uh, volume of timber. Um, conversely, if you come down here, you're close to 2,000 kilowatt hours per ton because there's a lot of work being done by the remaining carbon and, and energy in the wood to get rid of that water. Um, done quite a bit of work over the years in um, Georgia and um, a place called Abkhazia, which used to be part of Georgia until the Russians interfered with it, and since we're doing the Ukraine at the minute. Um, and a lot of that was around dealing with the cultural norm they have there of um, burning wet wood. So they, they sort of process it, chop it down and process it October, November, and then use it to eat the houses through the rest of the winter. So some pretty horrendous um, air quality issues that they have, which we'll, we'll cover sort of towards the end of the presentation. But it's part of what we're doing there was trying to sort of educate the population around the implications of using wet wood at just sort of a practical level. And some of the sort of messages we came out with around sort of making clouds by burning wet wood. Burning a wet log makes enough boiling water for six cups of tea, even if you don't have visitors. So trying to emphasize to people that, that getting rid of that water before you stick it on your fire makes a, makes a significant difference. The corrosive impacts um, of burning wet wood as well can be pretty significant. And also just the extra effort required. Um, some of the work we did on the forestry side of things showed that um, in Abkhazia in particular, they burned a, they chopped down about twice as many trees as they needed to, to provide the amount of heat that they used for uh, space heating and cooking, which, you know, if you can get it down and dry it before you burn it, you chop down half as much wood. So, um, you know, give yourself a weekend off. So there's all sorts of reasons why you'd want to burn um, drier wood. So we're going to talk a little bit about how we, how we achieve that and what the differences between the two are. So on a weight basis, there's not really a great difference in heat output between hardwoods and softwoods. A lot of sort of, I'm not going to call it snobbery, um, but there's a lot of sort of misconceptions. I heat my house almost exclusively with softwoods. And almost exclusively that software at the moment is Leylandi. Um, I uh, delivery, and I say delivery, just was basically like a free tip for a free surgeon friend on my on my um, lawn uh, about two weeks ago. Start storm Armand hit, so yeah, if I'd wait, if I'd wait a little bit longer, I could have had some nicer stuff. But yeah, Leylandi is going to be next winter. Um, but the main difference is the sort of the bulk of it, the kind of sheer volume of the material, because softwood is about thirty percent bulkier in volume compared to the same weight of hardwood. Obviously, there's variation between the different species. Some are even denser, some are even lighter. Um, but that's kind of a rough rule of thumb. So properly dried softwood logs will give you a good flame, will burn well, but they will burn through them quicker because there's, there's basically less en energy in there. There's less sort of weight of carbon. Um, if you've got a well, nice dry material, sub 20% moisture content, it's a good, efficient, well-serviced wood burning stove. They, and if you use it properly, operator error is often a big sort of problem with um, uh, a big issue in uh, the operation of wood burning stoves at domestic scale. They will burn nice and hot and they'll get rid of all the resin. That's another misconception that you can't burn softwood because you fill your flue full of resin. Actually, if it's dry enough, and you burn it properly and you're not shutting your air feed down to sort of 10% all the time, you won't get those tar buildups. So softwood can be just as good, although you need a bit more of it and you're feeding your stove more regularly, can be just as good as burning hardwoods. Uh, just a little graph there that just shows the calorific value by solid volume. Um, we have about 20% more calorific value in dry wood than in, than in wet wood by volume. So just some useful graphs that will be in this presentation when. Uh, you can view it at your leisure. Um, looking at the calorific value by species, this is taken from um, Forestry Commission data. They used to have something called the Biomass Energy Center. The data is still out there on the web. There's some really useful tools that they have and ready reckoners and graphs and things. But you can see there the actual calorific value by species is virtually no variation, depending on what kind of random things you sort of throw in the mix, whether it's 
Norway spruce or ash or poplar or whatever, you know, the, the, the variation is very, very um, slight uh, when you take it down to kind of what the figure there, ODT, oven dry tons. So that is a theoretically achievable value. If you've removed every last drop of moisture from that timber, ODT is the, the, the sort of unit of measurement you've reduced it to. Uh, by the time you've done that, there's virtually no um, difference in terms of the, the, the available calories. So we've established this is an important thing to do, um, talk about how we're going to do it, and, and then some of the sort of why, further sort of why we're going to do it in terms of the sort of legislative requirements. Um, so why are we doing it? More heat from the same volume of timber, uh, which is important. Um, uh, when you've got limited space to store this stuff, if you've got a farm or estate and space isn't an issue, then it becomes um, less important. But if you're you know, a selling this into a domestic market, the last thing somebody wants is you know, the equivalent of a shipping container full of um, softwood logs stacked up outside the house. So people tend to focus on the hardwood logs um, if you're selling into market, you know, domestic markets. Um, on a wood burning stove, you really want to have a high temperature to burn efficiently. This is really important, a number of reasons for that. See if fire stays alight better if it's nice and hot, it's more controllable. And that's especially in the sort of modern stoves with the advanced air control, they really are at their best when you're giving them nice dry wood fuel. We touched this already, but wet wood fuel will typically, um, if you think of this, the, the fire triangle, where you've got your fuel, you've got your oxygen, you've got your heat. If you're putting wet wood in, and this is the reason folk in Georgia and other sort of parts of the Caucasus use wet wood, it's because the stoves are crap and they've got no ability to control the oxygen. So what they do is they put wet wood in to reduce the heat so that the fire stays in longer and they're not feeding it as often with some pretty horrendous um, implications for the particulates that come out of those flues. Um, in the UK, you can no longer sell firewood that's greater than 20% moisture content to sort of domestic end users. If you are selling it in volume, if you've got large volumes that are coming out of woodlands, then there's certain things that you need to say that we'll, we'll sort of cover in a, in a short while. Um, but getting those fires nice and hot, nice dry wood means that everything is performing as it should do in the fire triangle. Um, so how are we going to season it? Um, so seasoning in the round, uh, wind is far more important than sun. Um, so make sure you're in a nice windy spot where um, the wind can sort of whistle through the ends of the logs and pass between the logs and around and underneath. So raise it off the ground on bearers. Um, if you can cover a stack with tarpaulins or with plastic sheeting or something to keep the rain off the top. Um, really big logs, and there's a lot of really big logs on the ground at the moment in Northumberland and other places up and down the East Coast, uh, will take a long time to dry. So do consider finding a way to split those down. There are contractors who have the equipment to do this. Um, the most common devices you'll have are so Lasco screw splitter, which you can see there on the end of a mini digger. It's basically, a, there's all sorts of different sizes. It's basically a, a sort of a giant corkscrew on a traffic cone and you force that into the logs and it splits. I mean, it's really impressive, splits enormous pieces of timber into, into sort of long lengths, uh, lengthways and you can break it down again and again. So you get something that more resembles basically a, a giant sort of wedge shaped log, which will dry much, much quicker as you open up that surface area in the interior of the log. Um, a link there, they have them on the Jasper Wilson um, website. Something, as an alternative, and there's different configurations of these, um, uh, as a grapple splitter, this is a sort of fairly low cost entry level one, which you can see there, sort of it's a heart shape, almost it's sort of two big hydraulic claws that come in and will split the log along its length in a similar way to the screw splitter, and um, probably a little bit cheaper one of these things. Um, and again, you can you can see there's Austrian equipment there, the, the West Tech Woodcracker, about, about 15 different types and sizes that they've, they've got on their website. The Austrians love, and the Germans as well, love their kind of wood fuel production machinery, and that's where you'll find most of the best quality equipment comes from. Um, if you're drying it in the forest or in the woodland, um, you've got the advantage that once you have dried it, you can fit more onto a timber lorry or onto a trailer or however it is you're bringing out, but really do try and steer your stack clear of the drip line. So make sure it's out in an exposed part of the woodland and you're not just having the water falling on trees and then dripping onto the stack because particularly with conifers, you can end up the kind of edge of umbrella effect. If you've been unfortunate to have your shoulder sticking out of an umbrella, um, you'll know that that's where an awful lot of water gets. So it's the same with logs as well. So just try and keep it nice open stack with a nice windy spot. 
Um, once you've processed it, what are you going to do with it? If it's just for your own use, then this is probably going a little bit too far. But if you are looking to, to sell this either wholesale or, or retail, there's a whole way of diff different ways you can do it, different sort of types of technology, um, some nice simple stuff. So you can see on the back of that tractor there, basically somebody loaded a, a metal frame. Um, so you can see that that bundles, that wood max. If you click on that, or when you have a look at them online, basically it's a metal frame. You load your logs in by hand and then you put a steel or a plastic band around it. You can roll them around. You can sort of you know, roll down people's driveways. It's quite a low cost, low tech way of um, bundling up quite a nice, dense, movable stack of timber. Um, right the way through to something like this, uh, a posh firewood bagger, a uh, German manufacturer, where you sort of have this roll of um, mesh on there, you band it onto a pallet, um, you sort of load the top in there and, and lift, the, lift the arm, and at the end of it, you've got a nice uh, big stack uh, of sort of loose stack timber. Similarly, vented bags, bag supplies, um, pretty good, well-known supplier to the log, um, log supply industry. Um, netted bags that you can then put on pallets and stick on top of each other, stack them in a big shed to dry them out. Um, so all sorts of different types of technology, um, you know, high tech and low tech that you can use to bring this stuff into sort of recognizable volumes for retail or just for ease of moving around or, or drying. Getting onto industrial auction sites, finding yourself some stackable steel cages is a pretty good, um, pretty good thing to be doing as well. There's generally lots of those available. Um, a second, I have to open my car door. My wife can get the dinner out of it. Uh, that's done. Right. Okay. Um, so what are we looking for? This is what we're looking for. Once we dried our timber, so on the left-hand side, you can see pretty much a fresh veiled log. So you can see little bits of sort of um, sort of foamy fungus stuff coming out the end of there. It's dark on there where it's quite wet. That's really not suitable for what it was intended for at that time, which was about to go into a wood burning stove. Far better is what you're seeing here on the end of this, which is the signs that the bark's coming off, the end's gone nice and gray, and you know, the wood's clearly sort of, you know, well, well and truly dead and dried and it starts to crack. So that's a, by far the simplest way of telling if a piece of wood is ready to be classed as firewood. Um, forget your pin meters. Um, this is, you know, a clear indicator of, of bad and good firewood. Um, some people have invested in forced drying. There was a, I'm not going to go into detail on the renewable heat incentive, but that was a government support scheme that ran for 10 years. Um, and for a, quite a while, there was a bit of a trend towards forced drying using biomass wood chip boilers and batch fed boilers to dry wood uh, using you know, shipping containers with fans in the end. Um, that's really what you need to do in some form or other to achieve a, a sort of a premium quality firewood, you know, sort of 15% and below. Um, really, you need to understand the economics of that. If you're spending a load of money on, on equipment um, and, you know, you really need to be getting into this in a, in a big way if you're making a big investment in this. Uh, otherwise, you know, the cost of producing that product would be very high. The reason it was attractive for the RHI is people were paid to dry wood. Um, um, really, if you're producing a premium product, it needs to look good. Um, it's be like kind of in, in Norway, they have a they have a standard of wood which is for the um, the sort of the visually attractive wood. So it's not just about you know, certain sizes and the kind of is it hardwood or softwood. There's a the real premium standard even has, and it must look pretty as well. Um, so you don't have anything quite as daft in this country, but they can take their firewood a bit more seriously in Norway. But really, you know, you want to be selling a premium product. So you want it to be nice and dry. Um, how long is it going to take to, to dry something? Um, so if it's in the round and it's hardwood, you know, if it's a reasonable diameter, um, you're looking at probably two to three years to get that down to a, a sort of a, a burnable moisture content. I know talking to a state in Yorkshire, probably going about 15 years now, but they had achieved in one year, it was a particularly dry summer, they had achieved 18% moisture content in 12 months. They were delighted, but that's definitely the exception rather than the norm. With softwood, you're looking sort of one to two years if you're drying it in the round. Once you split it, you're sort of halving that time, um, uh, maximum time, but you can get as low as six months once you split that wood, wood down into, into smaller pieces. So it's kind of, you know, ready to go into the size and ready to go into a, into a fire. And this is the benefit of sort of forced drying if you're using some form of heat to do this with a biomass boil or something, excuse me. Um, you know, you could do that. You know, you could do a couple of batches in a week 
Um, if you've got a big demand for the, for the material in the market uh, with hardwood, um, you, know, you could be doing 24 hours for softwood. So you, know, you can produce a lot of product at the right moisture content very quickly. And with force drying sort of passive uh, methods, um, so you're not providing an external source of heat, but you are using you know, um, wind or solar power, solar kind of in a polytunnel or a greenhouse, you can bring that down to a few weeks. So it's, it's horses for courses, you know, who's your market, how fast they want the material, um, there's lots of different steps to consider. And just a little graph here from, there's a really good um, handbook resource, which I think we'll probably send out a link to. Um, it's produced by ABOM, which is now um, um, European, uh, European sort of bioenergy association. Um, ABOM, it's called the Wood Fuel Handbook, and it's full of really, really useful information on how to produce all sorts of different forms of wood fuel. And just there, yeah, some field trials they did show that yeah, this is the rate at which hard and soft woods you know, over two years kind of drop. So stuff that's felled and, and laid down to dry in December by the summer is dry enough to burn 20% and it drops. And then as you kind of start to come back into the winter, that same material is monitored on a, on a monthly basis and it starts to re-wet again as moisture comes in as the, as the climate changes throughout the year. So it's going to be done, if it's done properly, it can be done in six months. In terms of size, size is also really important. If you're selling logs, customers typically want a uniform product that fits their appliance, not the kind of jumbled sort of all sorts of bits and bobs that my log pile looks like, but I'm happy with it. I can remember um, putting most of the different logs in it when you find an interesting one, kind of a memory. Um, and um, what they're after is logs that are about 25 centimetres long, and five to 15 centimetres at the widest point. That will fit into most common stoves. Lots of surface area, wedges or half moons, depending on the material you're starting with. Um, but if you've got species like poplar, you can make them into things that look like house bricks, um, uh, the way they split. Really try and avoid big oversized chunks. If you're burning wood at home, don't put great big chunks on as big as your head because they're usually wet in the middle and they produce lots and lots of smoke and tar on combustion. You can see the difference there. That's the same type of stove. This nice long piece here, um, not too big a diameter, burning quite happily right along its length, nice hot embers underneath. This here, that's a chunk of wood that someone just jammed in there uh, and that will burn and smolder and produce an awful lot of smoke and tar on combustion. So how are we processing this? Like with anything, there's all sorts of people there to sell you all sorts of different machines from vertical splitters that you sort of load by hand to ones that are conveyor belt fed, uh, either circular saws or chainsaws and splitters. This one PTO driven. This one's got its own engine. Um, you know, you can spend tens and tens of thousands of pounds on log splitters. Um, this here uh, is for a premium product. So this is cleaning. You can see here these discs spin around. Conveyor belt feeds it from the log splitter, cleans off all the bark and the bits. So the customer is getting a nice, super clean premium product. This is again from Posh. The range of equipment they produce is truly phenomenal. Uh, and all the bits and bobs go in the bottom, I guess, with kindling or you know, used in some of the process. Or a lot of farmers in particular will um, you know, just use their skills, a hydraulic ram and a bit of, you know, bit of steel lying around the farmyard, you know, there's plenty of that, and produce their own. Um, don't really advocate that because they don't really have safety features. Uh, and um, yeah, the guy I've worked with has lost most of his fingers to one of these things after taking the safety guard, actually took the safety guards off a, off a proper one. And yeah, it's not pretty. And these things are dangerous, particularly when you look at size of some of the rams on here and some of the sort of manual handling issues. So I really don't advocate this, but um, you know, there are cheaper ways to do it than going out and spending money with a you know, Bilky or Hacky or Posh or whoever. In terms of sort of conversion facts, some useful rules of thumbs, roughly you're taking solid round wood and a cubic meter of that will produce two to 2.2 cubic meters of chopped loose firewood. So just some useful sort of measures there. If you're stacking it nice and neatly, one meter log for, um, for, for, for log boilers, then you know, you're gonna get them you know, more uh, sort of um, a lower kind of volume for the same density. Uh, and then obviously if you're putting it into a chipper, you're sort of fluffing it up like a candy floss machine. So a cubic meter of wood will turn into roughly three cubic meters of a medium grade wood chip. Just a few more conversions there. So if you've got 20 cube round wood from a mixed hardwood thing, by the time you've done that, dead sim, just simple maths there. You know, you've got 44 cubic meters of split firewood. So think about how you're gonna handle this, where you're gonna put it. Uh, is this what a customer wants? Do they know where they're gonna put 44 cubic meters of split firewood? Uh, all sorts of sort of things to think about there. 
just to sort of finish up, um, if I'm wrapping through this fast enough, I have talked for uh, three days is the longest I've talked about firewood and biomass production. So this is really rattling through it. Um, some of the recent legislation and quality requirements that are associated with um, wood burning. Now, this is all driven by air quality regs. Um, lots of tightening of air quality. You will pick it up in the news fairly regularly about air quality. Uh, wood burning held to be the boogeyman of um, urban air quality in particular when, you know, a lot of it's kind of open air burning of leaves and rubbish and cars and trucks and other forms of combustion. But in some areas, you know, certainly rural areas where you see somebody burning wet wood in an in a open fire or in a log burner, you know, just that one house can be a pretty major source of pollution just for, just for the whole village. Um, so we have a whole range of different things that have sort of tightened the screw in, on um, what you can and can't do with firewood in recent years. Um, big one at the minute is uh, the ready to burn, which became law, so we'll go into that a little bit, but it's, this is only ever going to get tighter. Um, so if we get our house in order as wood fuel producers now and we're producing good products, we're following the rules, it's ready to burn, then we're less likely to attract the ire and further legislation that will um, make the market harder and harder to access. This is something that was produced by DEFRA. Um, interesting, we're in the DEFRA office and we um, have an email today offering us a whole lot of free pallets for wood burners from uh, part of the DEFRA office. I'm not quite sure how they sort of square that with their sort of corporate mission to improve air quality. But that was, that was caused a lot of entertainment in our office this afternoon. Um, so this just sort of shows the levels of particulate emissions that you get from different forms of appliances. This green at the end here, this electric heating, is why government is obsessed with um, heat pumps because they see it as involving no combustion. So you get a, you know, not only can, can you do this renewably, but also you're not uh, causing air pollution. And we get to where we are at the moment with DEFRA exempt eco design stoves. That is quite a high figure. You can do better than that with nice dry firewood and, and a good quality uh, stove. You can't buy these things anymore. Um, but again, there's a spectrum here of things that are also impact on not just the appliance, but in terms of the fuel. So coal, bloody awful stuff. The sooner we stop burning that, the better. Wet wood, bloody awful stuff. Um, solid fuel nuggets, you know, mixtures of all sorts of weird and wonderful things in these and constantly kind of evolving market. Uh, interestingly, um, DEFRA are trying to deal with an influx of lignite nuggets after they banned um, coal, um, uh, certain types of coal. So the lignite nuggets coming in mixed with olive pumice and all sorts of funny stuff that are just as bad as coal, if not worse. But dry wood is here at the less dirty end of the spectrum, so we're, we're kind of all right for the time being. So a piece of legislation that came in in 2020, which is, is the Air Quality Domestic Solid Fuel Standards England regulations, always super catchy with their titles. Um, what happened then was in May 2021, for the majority of firewood suppliers, and there's a 12-month grace period for, for smaller producers, uh, who produced less than 600 cubic meters. Um, so that kind of the clock's ticking on that, we've got a few months left to benefit from that. That legislation applies to them. So it's basically about trying to get rid of the more polluting domestic fuels in the market and only wood, which is classified as uh, ready to burn and less than 20% moisture content can now be sold. Um, when you do sell it, it needs to, uh, when sold less than two cubic meters, so, you know, bags of four quarts or, you know, if you deliver in a couple of cube in a small trailer to a customer, you must provide them with the, the name of the person who got the certificate from the approved wood body, which will be Woodsure and the Ready to Burn scheme, uh, and also the number of the certificate issued by this body under Regulation 5. So that Regulation 5 identifies the process for that wood certif certification body to actually operate. So what this is trying to do is sort of cut out the kind of you know, the bags of wet logs on a garage forecourt and sort of deal with that sort of market so that people aren't burning wet wood in their, in their houses and contributing to air pollution. Obviously, it doesn't deal with people who find their own wood when they're out walking the dog or do dash stuff like pick it up on the beach and all that kind of thing. But it's just trying to drive air quality improvements through regulating firewood sales. And then bits of education information is part of this as well, conducted by Ready to Burn and others. And it also places statutory duties on local authorities to enforce this stuff. But given they struggle to collect the bins these days, I'm not sure local authorities will be paying that much attention to, to this sort of legislation. Uh, once you're above two cubic meters, I'm guessing that's where most folks on this um, uh, webinar will be. Um, 
you have to include a whole load more wording on, on the documentation that you provide to the end customer. So that end customer might be somebody who then further processes that on into actual firewood if you're selling it in the round to be turned into firewood. Uh, or you might be selling it wet for somebody then to dry it themselves. So if you're sort of playing a sort of a wholesaler supplier type role, you must provide all this sort of information here, which is basically saying you can't just burn this stuff now. It does need to be dried. And it's about educating the that kind of intermediary or that retailer. Um, and it's just a bit of good practice and stuff I was mentioned earlier on about you know, the bark coming off and the ends being split. Um, so that information has to be provided if you're selling more than two cubic meters of firewood. Live on the schemes, so woodsure.co.uk and readytoburn.org. Basically, ready to burn is run by Woodsure. They're not quite the same thing, but this is the scheme which is uh, sort of authorized and mandated by government for the sale of um, wood to wood burning stoves. Register on these schemes. Um, there's an annual registration fee pushing 400 quid, um, actually over 400 quid if you, uh, you're not VAT registered. Was it? No, sorry, forget that. 385 plus, which includes the VAT. Uh, and an application fee in the first instance as well. So, you know, you're um, 500 quid to get started and then nearly 400 quid uh, each year to stay registered on the ready to burn scheme. Um, there is the possibility of group schemes. So people working together under the same certificate, um, which will take some of that pain away. But it's, you know, if you're getting into selling firewood, this is this is another burden and you'll have to carry and another cost on the business. Um, it is relatively straightforward and a simple application form. But what you're effectively signing up to do is providing firewood that is legal and is dry um, and that you can provide all that sort of through an audit process uh, to, to demonstrate that you've done this. Um, so, yeah, I'd recommend you have a look on the, on the Ready to Burn website and understand what that process is. You then get to use this nice little logo that says um, you can you can sell this material to the market, and you get a product uh, a product specific um, registration number. As a wholesaler, you can piggyback on someone else's certification, but you have to use that logo from the registered business. You can't just kind of add your own number to the bottom, and you can't use that Woodshore logo uh, uh, as a third party unless you're kind of on on the scheme and you've got permission to do that. So that was a high speed romp through the world of um, uh, log production and legislation and why moisture content is important. We have eight questions in the chat. I think I right. will. Thank you very much, Neil. That was great. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so we've got a few questions there. Um, yeah. uh, Joe Cartwright, are you still around, Joe, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Hello. Can Hello, Joe. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. No, I just wondered how you check the moisture on on the logs. Is there some sort of little machine you stick into the logs, or what? Or do you uh, just? I mean, if you want to get, uh, it's, it's a funny one because there's all sorts of different moisture meters you can get. I mean, you can buy them from any sort of arbor supplies or you know garden centres. Do them. I've got one with my that's what burn stove I bought, and they can be. Um, you know, it's this sort of size, you know, kind of car key size with a couple of little pins on the side and a little battery and you stick it in and the pins are um, five millimeters long and they, they basically measure your electrical resistance to the, the wood and they'll tell you supposedly how dry or wet that wood is. Now, we did a training course a good number of years ago now, but everybody was asked to bring their own moisture meter. And then what we did is we got all the moisture meters in a row and we all tried the same log in pretty much the same place and the range of moisture readings was enormous. Um, so they're not particularly accurate. I mean, they're a good guide, but I would be certainly looking for some of those visual clues as well. Um, and don't measure on the ends because the ends dry out first. So chop a log. If you've got a pile of logs, take one from the middle, chop it in half, stick a pin meter in it, and that's going to be your best quick way of doing it. The other way to do it is to weigh it and then chop it into slices and then dry it in an oven at 120 degrees and weigh it every couple of hours to, to, till the moisture stops going out of it. So it stops losing weight. And then there's a calculation you can do, which just shows you how much water is in it and how dry it is, but that's pretty involved. Um, I've been banned from doing that at home now. That was because I tried to dry a load of them, um, used horse bedding and it smelled quite the same as um, wood chips. So um, yeah, if, you, if you've got an oven somewhere that you can put this stuff in, then um, it's, uh, yeah, that's, that's another way to do it. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Neil. Uh, question from Tom. Tom Longsdale, are you are you around? Unmute yourself. Uh, yeah. Thanks very much. Um, 
I'm just curious, um, you say the accumulator is necessary with a log boiler. I just wondered whether they need to be um, immediately adjacent or whether there can be a short distance between, um, possibly with a, a pipe through a wall or whatever. Uh, yeah, no, they, they, they don't need to be immediately adjacent. I mean, you know, you don't want it miles and miles away, but no, you could be. It's just increases sort of heat losses between the boiler and the tank, and then sort of more pumping as well. So, but you know, we've done sites, um, wood chip boiler, we did one at Minster Acres, which is just on the sort of border of Northumberland County Durham, where they're, they're in a completely separate room, you know, on the other side of a corridor. Um, so it's it's obviously depends what space you've got available. If you've got right. a giant room with a boiler and two accumulator tanks, then happy days. But if not, you use the space you've got available. Fine, thanks. Thank you, Neil. Thanks, Tom. Um, Mark Corner. Yes, thank you. That was really uh, helpful. Um, what's the maximum size of a log that doesn't need splitting? So how do you trade off the seasoning time and the handleability and the sort of work of splitting? So it, you, is 15 centimetres the number you mentioned? Is that, is that right? I think, I, think, I mean... You don't, you don't want to handle it more than once, really. So if you've got some big hardwoods that need to be split, I would get them down to that sort of size um, in, in one pass with a, you know, with a cracker or a, a screw and, and go for that size and dry them at that size. So what you don't want to do is you know, split a log in half and then dry it and then pick it up again and split it again into smaller pieces. Um, so I would say aim to get it down to that sort of maximum 15 centimetre at its widest part in, you know, at first pass. Just, just because every time you touch it, and we, we looked at chip um, production once for Forest Commission in Wales, and it was it was four pounds a ton every time you touched it. So every time you touched a ton of wood chip and moved it somewhere, in a not not by putting on a truck, but every time you moved it around a yard or you, you know, you picked it up in the end of a chip and put it somewhere else, it was four pounds a ton just just in terms of handling costs. Probably gone up quite a bit now because that was a while ago, but. Um, yeah, the fewer sort of processes, the better. So I would say hit it and get it down to that size, you know, first pass. It will dry faster and you won't have to then reprocess it again when it's, even, when it's a bit drier. Okay. You also mentioned uh, stove um, servicing. Apart from the flu, what can you do to a stove? Um, a, thorough, a thorough clean out, um, clean out above the, above the battle plate. So most stoves in the top, they have a battle plate that comes out, um, clean the airways. Um, make sure that the the sealant tape around the door is intact. Um, what you really don't want to have is something called rogue air, which is air that the stove doesn't know that it's getting. So the same with you know, any kind of combustion appliance, if it's getting air that it doesn't know about, it's not going to be burning the way it should be. So if you've got, you know, inspect the rope around the window of a stove or the door on a stove, if that's got gaps in it or it's been com compressed. That'll be pulling air in that can create hot spots. It can create damage. It can, you know, interfere with the the designer's combustion because these things are very carefully designed. I mean, obviously not the ones are made of old gas cylinders, but you know, the modern uh, high quality appliances are designed to burn nice and clean and efficiently. So if you've got air in that it doesn't know about, then you'll then you'll start to have problems. So I mean, there are there are companies who do more than just sweep the chimney. Um, my stove chimney guy is is absolutely brilliant, and he'll you know he'll refurbish them and he'll replace bricks and all sorts of stuff. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Neil. Yes, um, I, I, certainly. I think if you use a chimney sweep that's a member of the National Association of Chimney Sweeps, they will they will do that usually yep. as a matter of course as part of um, sweeping a chimney, and it's and it's certainly uh, you know well well worth doing and doing properly. So yeah, yep. so, I mean, about one from, from personally, I for about once once a month in the winter, I'll take out all of the little kind of air bricks, the sort of sort of very light sort of refractory lining, take all that out, and just get the whole thing. Hoovered spotlessly clean and then get those back in again with all the air holes nice and clean. It just, it's, you know, you, you see the difference you see and it's like night and day. Mm. Right, thanks. Thanks, Neil. Um, right, and I think time for one last question from Mark Shipperley. You, you around, Mark? Yeah, yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, it was really good, Neil. Um, I've got a back boiler still and I'm, I just keep wondering about whether to put a wood burner in, but I obviously want to get the way to heat water again can we can we fit them into existing systems with copper tanks as a wood burner you, you um, quickly run over heating water with a wood burner yeah i mean you get a wood burner with a, with a little sort of um air to water heat exchanger in the back and if you've got your, if your copper tanks you know in the roof my, that's what exactly what my in-laws have and the water right, passes okay. through a jack the jacket of the stove 
uh, yeah. and is pu pumped around through the stove and just goes up and heats the heats the water tank. And if right. if they're not using the water and they're still using the stove, it can kind of boil out the roof. So um, yeah, you need to be. Need to yeah, be I sometimes I have to do the bath with the back boiler. And can you then put yeah. it into your radiators as well or not? Uh, you yeah. For that. Yeah. And what, yeah, yeah. what sort of names that. are out there for doing those sort of boilers? Oh, gosh. Um, burners. I think main laws have got a clear view. Uh, oh, right, okay. Big manufacturers, yeah. So give, give them a try. But, you know, just, yeah. just go to the big stove retailer and they'll be able to advise you properly on that. Okay, um, yeah, it's, and, and that's, that's definitely possible. Um, right, okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Okay. Great. Okay, thank you very much for that, Mark. Um, and we're almost dead on time. So that was really, really well done, everybody. Um, got a few people needing to leave now. So um, I think just... That leaves me to say that this evening's webinar will be uh, made available on YouTube if you do want to rewatch it or if you know somebody who hasn't been able to, they want to catch up, um, we'll get it on there in the next couple of days and we'll be letting you have a link um, for that. Um, so, as I mentioned earlier on, this is one of a series of um, webinars we're running. Uh, next Tuesday, we'll, we'll be um, discussing uh, woodland management planning and other such subjects. So if you want to join us then, please do so. We've got your details and we'll be sending you further information about that. So thank you very much, Neil. Thank you everybody for okay. joining us. Good evening. Yeah, thanks for showing up. Good evening. Thanks. Bye-bye.